Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual town hall for faculty and staff. I'm Joanne Brasington, your host and moderator. This event is supported by the offices of Marketing and Communications and Information Technology Services with special thanks to Martin Agner for his technical expertise and Marco Linke for help with the slides. Joining me are panelists, Dr. Naif Samhat, President, Dr. Mike Sosulski, Provost, Roberta Hurley, Vice President and Dean of Students, Chris Gardner, our CFO, Brian Stilley, Vice President for Enrollment, Dan Dieter, Director of Business Services and Risk Management and leader of the college's COVID-19 working group, Beth Wallace, Associate Vice President and Director of the Wellness Center and Chi Lee, Director of Human Resources. This will last no more than 45 minutes. If you cannot stay for the event, we will post a recording and transcript at wofford.edu slash coronavirus under the town hall icon. Let's begin with remarks from President Sam Hat. There we go. Thanks, Joanne. And thanks everyone for participating this afternoon. Of course, since the end of December uh, and uh, in the past week, we've heard from uh, a number of faculty and staff, as well as faculty leaders on the President's Advisory Committee. Uh, I appreciate all their work and support. Uh, many of you, I know, are concerned about the student experience, your colleagues, and the health and well-being of everyone uh, in our community. Of course, I understand those concerns because they have been top of my mind a night and day, uh, actually since March uh, of last year. You know, on any given day, we have about 2,200 people on this campus, so making decisions that affect each and every one is a pretty considerable responsibility, uh, but it's also a, a, an honor and I know it's a trust placed in uh, me and the senior team. Uh, we have been committed to our three goals. Number one is ensuring the health and safety of everyone on this campus, delivering our mission and preserving the material well-being of everyone on this campus. Uh, I want to thank uh, members of the faculty and staff and the Wellness Center. Uh, our Wellness Center staff have done extraordinary work uh, uh, on the working group. They have done extraordinary work in the calendar committee as well. Uh, faculty across various departments, our facility staff, everyone has worked overtime to provide expertise, advice, and encouragement so we could get through this together. We have found ways to fulfill our mission and stay true to our core values in spite of the challenges caused by this global pandemic. What we're facing, as you know, is common among our peer institutions and we have been resilient and persevered in ways I know others have not been able to do so. We've managed uh, preserving employment and our programs and frankly, that is no small feat when many colleges around us have faced some very difficult decisions in those areas. So we've been very fortunate. Uh, we have been able to succeed in this regard to this point uh, because of the great commitment of faculty and staff to ensuring we provide a transformational education. Thanks again for your service to our students and our college. And even as you too deal with loss, isolation, uncertainty, Let's take some comfort knowing that we are in this together as a community. We are resilient and I appreciate it. And before long, I truly believe we'll be through this. Now let's begin, Joanne. All right, Mark, let's start with the first question. Has enrollment and retention been affected by the pandemic? Brian Stilley, would you answer this question? Yeah, thank you, Joanne, and thanks for the question. Um, you know, Wofford has enjoyed record enrollment uh, this year, and that continues. Uh, it started in the fall where we had 1,758 students, our largest enrollment ever. Um, that compares to 1,712 in the spring, I mean, in the fall of 20. 
Um, this spring, um, our full-time equivalents for 12 hours is 1688. Last year in the spring, that number was 1621. And so again, record enrollment. We have seen an increase in the number of students who have withdrawn from Wofford this year as compared to the previous couple of years. Um, so far, students who started in the fall um, who have withdrawn that number is 47. Last year, we saw 26 students who had withdrawn. We have seen an increase. Um, the most recent withdrawals um, have mentioned the impacts of the pandemic um, on their decision to withdraw. Um, some students aren't satisfied or feel that um, the educational options fit their learning style. Others are concerned about just the full experience. And, and many of these students have told us that they intend to return when things are back to normal. And so we'll, be, we'll continue to track those numbers. We have a record number of applications um, for the fall of 2021. We're up 5% right now, which is about 200 applications. We've just gone past 4,200 applications for the year. We're excited about that. Currently, we have 136 students committed to enroll in 2021. Um, that's a little bit behind where we were last year due to a drop in early decision. Um, but we feel good about the increase in applications. We're confident that we'll be able to meet our enrollment goals for the fall of 2021. And Roberta Hurley sent me some statistics on the students who have withdrawn and I will put those in the chat next, in just a second. Next slide, Mark. How and why were students allowed to return to campus and attend in-person classes last week without submitting negative COVID test results? Roberta, would you handle that? Thank you, Joanne, and thanks for this question. And I'd first like to say that um, we believe the pre-arrival testing program was largely successful. We discovered 70 asymptomatic positive cases, and, um, uh, and then we discovered that a small percentage of our students, faculty, and staff did not submit a test initially. The intent was for every student to who came to campus to take and submit a negative test before coming to the campus. And each faculty and staff member was to be tested that first week of January 4th that we were back. Over 98% of our students complied with this requirement. Um, but then the process of checking 2,200 tests took longer than we had anticipated. We discovered that um, students, faculty and staff were having trouble uploading their um, tests but I was sent a list of students who had not submitted a test at last Monday on the 11th. And then I immediately contacted them. We, uh, then we called a meeting with campus safety, residence life staff and wellness center staff to determine if the students were on campus or not. We analyzed the data from the card key access system. We sent uh, residence life staff to, to actual rooms to check to see if the student were here to, uh, or not. The list initially had 150 students and 74 faculty and staff on it. Once we began tracking down uh, faculty, staff, and students, we were able to whittle the list down um, fairly quickly. We had students on our list who were doing internships off campus in Washington, DC and other locations. We had a couple of students who had graduated in December. And so um, we were able to quickly get that list down and now every single student who's living on the campus um, has uploaded a test. We, and then there are 11 students who not li living on the campus and not attending class in person. And they have been sent a letter, an e-letter saying that they are not allowed to come to campus for any reason whatsoever. And if they're found on campus, uh, they will perhaps could lose their um, enrollment for the spring semester. Thanks, Roberta. You're welcome. How many students were non-compliant with the testing and what are the consequences for student non-compliance? You really sort of answered that, but 
yeah, and I'll just repeat, there were 11 um, students who are not living on the campus and not coming to the campus. That um, So 11 out of, Graham said the number was 1688. Um, and I'm, I'm feeling a little bit higher because I count um, students who are taking any class. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What are the numbers on employee non-compliance with the testing and what are the consequences? Chi Lee, would you answer that one? Sure, Joanne. Thank you for the question. Um, well, I will reiterate or at least piggyback on what um, Roberta has stated. Um, out of the, um, uh, the Medicap system is, is what we're going on, but now let me backtrack and state that as of today or January 15th, I'm very pleased to report that we have zero employees that are non-compliant. But let me explain that 74 number that was originally provided. Um, as Roberta had stated, that 74 numbers out of Medicat were uh, individuals on the staff side that um, the Medicat system would not have known, and that included individuals working off campus, remotely, or for whatever other reason. And so we've worked with the Wellness Center and in going through and weeding through that list um, as of uh, January 15th, and thus also as of today, we have no employees that are non-compliant. Um, as far as consequences go, obviously, um, we would have asked um, employees to stay home um, and or obtain a test before coming to campus. Um, and if there were reasons why they couldn't take the test or didn't want to, obviously we would have exhausted measures of flexibilities before we would have um, moved on to any um, additional consequences. Thank you. What assurances do we have that students are taking this seriously and will follow testing protocols that will be in place beginning on February 1? Roberta, back to you. Thank you. Um, at this time, we do not have a pre-arrival testing requirement for February 1st. The working group met yesterday, as I understand it, and are discussing next steps. We are reviewing our data every day. And um, so I think that is to be determined. I do know, I mean, and this might come up later, but I do know that athletes are getting tested several times a week. Will faculty who feel uncomfortable teaching in person, but who have no documented health reasons, be allowed to teach remotely for the rest of the semester? Mike, could you answer that one? Happy to, thank you, Joanne. Um, so first let me say, uh, I really understand where this question is coming from. And I really want you to know that I feel what you're feeling, um, a strong sense of disappointment that we're in this place. Um, we had such a great fall semester and um, it's disappointing that we did have to go remote for a couple of weeks. So I, I share that. Um, I even understand why there might feel like there's a, a, a loss of some trust we had built up um, I think over the fall semester, a strong sense of mutual community trust about observing the guidelines. And so I understand that that feels like a loss. And, and I also understand how concerned everybody is, and I mean everybody, um, about health, safety, and well being during this really difficult time. So I understand the worry and understand where it's coming from. And uh, please believe me that this is what's on my mind every single day and on the minds of everyone on the senior leadership team as we make our way through this pandemic. I also have a couple of further thoughts I wanna share. Um, we really don't know exactly how things are going to go after this reset of two weeks is over. Things are changing with the virus and the pandemic very rapidly. And we are carefully monitoring a range of key indicators that are gonna guide how the college responds. Some of these indicators are the rate of testing in our state and our local region, the positivity rate on those tests, but also the hospital, a hospital bed occupancy percentage, both regular beds and ICU beds at Spartanburg Regional Hospital and other hospitals that are close by. We're also obviously monitoring developments on our own campus very, very closely. And I wanna echo what's been said already. Our wellness staff is 
they are our heroes right now. They are absolutely working overtime every single day to help us get through this crisis. And they are carefully monitoring the number of COVID cases among students and employees. They are uh, also monitoring very carefully the occupancy rate for the beds we have set aside for quarantine and isolation. So we are monitoring this from every angle carefully every single day. We take all these things and any other relevant data that we can lay our hands on into careful consideration as we evaluate how to operate best after February 1st. I also think there's a couple other things that are important for you all to know. First of all, there is no evidence whatsoever that the virus was transmitted in a classroom or laboratory on our campus in fall semester. And this has also largely been the, uh, the experience at colleges and universities across the country where masks and hygiene protocols are being carefully observed. Second thing is that from contact tracing, we know that transmission did occur on our campus through student gatherings outside of instructional settings. And this was both on and off campus. Having said that, there is a more transmissible strain of COVID-19 beginning to make the rounds. So we really all need to be extra vigilant about wearing masks at all times and keeping our distance. There's a really interesting piece uh, in the New York Times this morning about how you can reinforce your mask and, and uh, kind of cope better um, in the time of this new strain circulating. I want everyone to know that I will always make decisions based on what is best for the health and safety of everyone in our community. And that is true of everyone on the senior leadership team at Walford. I also think it's important for you to know that among our faculty and staff, I regularly hear a wide range of opinions about how we should be approaching our work in this time of COVID-19. Some people think that we should be fully remote. Some people think that we should be fully in person. Some faculty don't wish to teach wearing a mask, even though it's our firm policy that we must wear masks when we're teaching. Some people love teaching and holding meetings over Zoom. They think it's a better way. Some people detest it. We also have some faculty who are teaching remotely due to health concerns. And we have faculty who would qualify to teach remotely due to health concerns, but have chosen to teach in person instead. So there really is a range of opinions and responses among our colleagues. And I think it's important that everybody know that. There just is really no answer or approach that's gonna satisfy everyone. The same is also true, by the way, for parents and students. The senior leadership team at Wofford hears a range of opinions from them, both for and against remote teaching and learning, and also about the restrictions on student gatherings that we have put into place in order to contain the virus on campus. And I will just say that many of these opinions are quite passionate. I wanna end by saying that while at this time, there are no plans to alter the way we deliver instruction at Wofford. We will continue to think through what teaching and working on campus need to look like after February 1st. And we will base our planning on the very best and most complete health data that we can assemble, always prioritizing health, safety, and well being of everyone in our community at every time as we do it. Thanks, Mike. Dan Dieter, this one's going to be for you. Explain the testing plan that is set to begin on February 1. Are we testing asymptomatic cases? Are we doing random testing? What's the goal of testing? Thank you, Joanne. I'll, I'll start out by talking about surveillance testing, even though I think some of this is fluid as we work for, toward a solution uh and the modification of our testing for uh our reset and restart but surveillance testing by design is set up in order to uh, get a measure of positivity on our campus at any given time a snapshot we had scheduled um, a minimum of four separate surveillance testing dates through dhec um, four separate date sets of time or instances of two dates. So 
two days at a time at four different times through the semester. Um, and our intent was to test a minimum of 25 to 35% of campus each one of those times on a random basis, as the question asks, uh, to get a look at what those uh, positivity rates are and also to get a, uh, you know, a snapshot of, and find asymptomatic cases. As um, Dean Hurley talked about, we did identify 70 cases with our pre-arrival testing um, of COVID that we would not have identified until they spread on campus. Those were asymptomatic cases. Uh, so as I said, we have further dates scheduled throughout the semester. I have further questions down the road. I've seen a lot of questions in the chat about our testing plans. So stay tuned. Uh, there'll be more information coming your direction. Okay, Dan, stay, uh, stay close for this one, but it's gonna go to Beth Wallace first. With Walford set to become a vaccine site, what do we know about timing of the vaccine and who will get it? If faculty and staff members are teaching slash working remotely, what group are they in? Thanks, Joanne, and thank you all for people who are participating in this. I hope it's a helpful conversation and answering of some questions. That we have done everything we are to do with Chris Gardner's help as a CFO to register as a vaccine site. Every time an email comes through asking for more information, we respond to it immediately in hopes that that helps um, make accelerate that process. At this point, we've done everything that we are to do. My speculation, and after being on the um, vaccination uh, management system, it is truly speculation. It's a little bit difficult to navigate. My speculation is that we will get some vaccines because we do have such a large population in the 1B category, the educators. I do not know the timing. I can promise you, you will be hearing a squealing over here um, from all buildings when we do get those vaccines. I think a bit of good news, we were talking to Will Chrisman this morning in sports medicine. He shared with us that he has been trained by DHEC to give vaccines. So we will be pulling out all the stops and asking uh, some of our staff, such as the athletic trainers to help us, our staff here in the wellness center. We went and we're very fortunate that we were able to get a vaccine at regional the other night, Monday night, and Tammy, Gilliam, Lisa and I were there. And we asked the nurses, we stayed there for about 30 minutes to find out what supplies they had, looked at their setup, talked to them about process. So that actually was very helpful. And what we know we will need is trained people to give vaccines and other people who are just gonna be registering and giving out information. We also need some equipment that we've ordered, such as extra Benadryl or EpiPens and things like that in case of a reaction. Um, so we're on that. So we are preparing and we are ready to go. As soon as they tell us we're ready to go, we have it um, scheduled. We talked about location today and we'll continue to work through those logistics. The question about remote faculty and staff, I believe right now, depending on the amount of vaccines we get, we will work with the people coming to campus and working every day first in that 1B category or if we have individuals older than in the 1A categories indicated, we will certainly vaccinate them if they have not been. We have not set up all of our processes and protocols yet, but my first instinct to this question is we will be vaccinating people who are coming to campus and then we will work from there as far as people working remotely. What group are we in looks like a question and it, I believe educators and are in 1B, which is the next group to be vaccinated. I'm excited that we're able to do that on campus. I feel like it's a service that is something that we are thrilled to be able to provide. Thanks, Beth. Dan, do you have anything else on that one? I was only, I would only add, and everything she said is true and correct. Um, there, some people have had questions about educators extending to support staff. And I would add that the DHEC site says directly support staff as well as educators. So uh, I don't think there's a concern on that score. I would agree. Thank you, Dan. Great. 
If we are working as remote as possible, and so are our supervisors, how should we submit our time cards? Chi, that one's for you. Thanks, Joanne. Um, yes, um, obviously with you know remote work and with this current situation, the Office of Human Resources is going to be as flexible as possible as well in receiving those time cards. I would recommend that you know either just you know type up your times in an email or an Excel sheet, forward it to your supervisor, and then have your supervisor forward it to the Office of Human Resources, or more specifically, Lynn Casalino, and we're happy to receive it that way. Once you're back on campus or once you're able to enter office it to us, wonderful. But we will accept email um, in the interim so that um, no pay is altered. Okay, great. I have gotten a number of texts and emails from people who can't get into the uh, webinar. So if you know someone who is texting you, ask them to text Martin Agner. Thanks. Um, I appreciate that. All right, next, what's the status of the mold in the library? Mike, back to you. Oh yes, one of my favorite subjects. Um, uh, so actually the, there's really good news there. So um, for over a week now, the abatement team from a company called Belfour has been working diligently in the spaces where um, we've found mold and they are doing the remediation work and they're making excellent progress. Um, I could go into detail about the kinds of methods that they are using and the, uh, the, the materials they're using to clean the books, the shelves, and all the surfaces, but I won't go into that right now. I will just tell you that it's impressive and uh, we're making good progress. It should be a few more weeks before we are, we're done with that work uh, and we'll be able to circulate our materials again, just like before, but uh, it's really terrific to see this happening now. Well, good. Will all staff be required to wear masks and maintain social distance? I think the operative word is all. And Dan, that one can be for you too. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. Um, this rule hasn't changed to my knowledge since we started in, in uh, August talking about these rules. One, one constant of the recommendations from experts on the subject is that masks are helpful um, and statistics continue to bear that out. Yes, all, all staff are required to wear masks and maintain social distance. That includes inside and outside. We have a few um, job classifications where um, we are not requiring it because of the nature of their work. But uh, I will say that virtually everyone is required to do it. The only time you should be able to remove your mask is if you're alone in your private office. That's pretty much the rule that I've used um, going forward. Right now, I think it's particularly important if you're out on campus uh, that you're wearing a mask. We're setting an example, continuing to set a, an example for our uh, students. Um, and as we are sending the message of how imperative it is that everyone be compliant, uh, one way to do that is by donning that little mask on your face uh, when you're outside. And, and wearing it properly over your nose and chin. Um, so not, not the beard mask that we've seen popular in some of our um, community. Uh, so wearing a mask, it's important to note as, as well, it does not replace social distancing. It, it is in addition to social distancing. So please respect that rule and uh, make sure that people are doing so in your classroom so that we can maintain that a uh, perfect record of no transmission in the classroom that's so critical to our being able to continue. Thank you, Dan. Why is athletics still competing and why are they held to a different standard? Nath, this one's for you. Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, Student athletes have actually been held to a higher standard since the start of the pandemic. In addition to following Wofford guidelines, they're also following NCAA regulations, which vary from sport to sport, depending on the degree of contact. They've categorized different uh, sports by, uh, by intensity of contact. Uh, and I know during this two week period, uh, we've taken some special additional precautions uh, for the student athletes and the coaches. 
uh, but currently they're tested three times a week uh, and, um, and before competitions. We've had some isolated incidences of student athletes contracting COVID-19 and those are typically contained quite quickly. Uh, as you know, uh, we've had some events canceled, but I have to say, for instance, for the men and women's basketball teams, their cancellations have not been as a result of uh, issues on our side. Um, so, uh, so that's why. Um, and uh, by following NCAA guidelines, which were put in place and are uh, routinely reviewed and updated. Um, one thing I do want to say, though, uh, in relation to a, a question that Dan already answered, um, uh, and that is about testing. I know it weighs heavily upon the minds of all. And I, I would just ask for your patience. I know the working group is developing some uh, approaches to review and evaluate to ensure that uh, when we do come back, uh, we come back with a good comprehensive testing regime um, uh, and, and to ensure everyone's health and well-being. But uh, it does take some uh, planning and logistical work uh, and uh, sorting out different options. But um, I, I just ask for your patience. I know the working group and the Wellness Center are working very hard uh, to make sure we have something in place that will bring uh, all of you, all the faculty and staff, the reassurance uh, you want and you need and you deserve. So thank you. Thank you. Will all staff be, um, next question. That's the wrong way. Wrong way, Mark. Keep going. One more. What options for entertainment and distraction are you providing for students during this enhanced quarantine? Roberta. I know you've got a good answer for this. Well, Joanne, first I would like to say while I have the floor that I really wanna thank the faculty and staff who have worked with um, all the different areas, Campus Safety, Wellness Center, Residence Life, as we've um, contacted you about students who needed extra assistance or who were ill and would not be in your classes, et cetera. Um, I meant to say that earlier. And so I just wanna recognize that we appreciate everyone partnering with us to make sure our students will be successful because nobody likes this reset. So um, I wanted to ask, to answer the question, what, what I started last September was sending an email to the whole student body every Friday with list of things that were going on on campus and, and thing, uh, events that we thought would be safe to attend off campus. And so last Friday, I restarted that um, habit or program. And um, some I would get responses from students. So I knew some of them were reading them and I, some of them were sending them to their parents. And um, so I've asked Joanne to put part of what I sent them last Friday in the chat, just so you can get an example of the information we're sending out. And so we, so our staff, uh, campus life and student development staff help me compile things to put in it every weekend. One way that faculty could help us is to call it, you know, at, encourage students to read the email, but also to um, let them know that I heard from a couple of students this week who just feel like we're not being transparent and we really don't want to be in person. And I've tried to reassure them that we do want to teach in person. We do want them to be able to have traditional or what they know to be traditional spring events on campus. The seniors are, are um, hopeful and in trying to encourage each other to um, comply with the guidelines so they can start planning their commencement weekend activities. And so if you can just be encouraging to the students and let them know that we really all want to return to a new normal, especially um, once we all get the vaccines. So I appreciate your help. If any faculty member ever has something they want me to include in the email, just shoot me shoot me an email by Friday morning. Thanks. Okay, Roberta, I'm trying really hard to copy and paste this, but it's not letting me. So I'm gonna keep trying, hang in there. And if at the end of this, you want to see one of those emails and I haven't been able to put it in there, just email me and I'll send it to you. And I'm happy to send them the one I'm working on for tomorrow. 
And thank you, Rick Sheehan, for offering to take students out to the disc golf and demonstrate the game. Excellent idea. I might take you up on that. I was going to tell them I'd sing and dance, but then they would all run screaming off the campus. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, how much emphasis is the college placing on the bottom line when it comes to keeping students on campus? How do we stand financially? Chris Gardner, this is why you're a panelist. <laughs> well, thanks, Joanne. Um, so I want to address the first part of this question, and then we'll bleed into the second part uh, as we go. And I want to address... Um, the first part in kind of two ways. And the first is the fairly straightforward way, uh, which is to talk about, you know, our decision-making process and the fact that, you know, as we were faced with rising case counts uh, a week, week and a half ago, um, and as a, as a senior leadership team, as we got together to discuss the issues and how we might respond, um, the topic of the bottom line and the financial impact of those decisions, um, we didn't really have a su substantive discussion about that. Uh, I think we all understand that that all the decisions we make have financial impacts in one way or another, um, but it's really about making the right decision, prioritizing the health and wellness of our community, and prioritizing our mission as a liberal arts residential experience uh, where we get to be together uh, and have a meaningful educational experience because we're together. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, my job then is to take what the, <laughs> those decisions and try to uh, try to consider the financial impact and, and, and evaluate ways to mitigate that impact. But the other, the other way I wanna address this question and I'll try to keep it brief, but I'll tell you, I believe really strongly that in the long run, making the right decision to support the community's health and wellness and to support the mission of the college is also the right financial decision. The problem is that in the short run, sometimes it can feel the opposite of that. And so I think that we are in a position and we entered, I said 10 months ago as we entered this pandemic that the only good thing about it from a financial perspective was that we were entering it in as strong a place as we possibly could have entered uh, at that time. And over the last 10 months, we spent a lot of time uh, taking efforts to improve that financial situation and position. And so, you all have experienced some of those, right? We've had hiring freezes, we've had salary freezes, we've had operating budget freezes. Those are all things we've done to try to preserve uh, our financial well-being. We uh, we executed some some um, strategy with our debt portfolio, and that has preserved additional capital for us uh, to allow us to address financial issues that arise. And so. What that means is that we're in a position where, in my opinion, we're able to sort of just be less concerned about the short-term financial impact and focus more on the long-term financial impact on the college. And there are a lot of places out there that aren't in that position, and therefore they do feel a tension between the short-term financial costs uh, of the decisions they make and, and the health and wellness of the community. But I don't think we don't feel that tension as much. And so that, I think that allows us uh, to have the discussions and the conversations we have without immediately talking about the financial situation. And so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, we've, we've done a number of things that have really put the college and continue to place the college in a good position financially. Um, as Bran said, enrollment has been good uh, and that is the primary driver of our financial health. Uh, but the other steps we've taken uh, in terms of hiring freezes, salary freezes, budget freezes. Uh, those are all things that have put the college in as good or better of a financial position as we were 10 months ago when this all started. Thanks, Chris. Detail the process the college will undertake before making the decision to return to in-person instruction. Dan, this one's for you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I feel like we've covered some of these things in, in other answers, and Mike did a good job of summarizing some of the matrices that we use. Uh, but we, they're the same measures that we use to decide that we needed to go remote again. Um, there, there are local and regional case counts, which over the last few weeks have been uh, not particularly positive or, or not in a good 
place. Uh, the minute they seemed to be declining, we had a spike one, the next day. Um, so that's one of the things we consider. Um, positivity rates, obviously, in the community um, is also important. Hospital occupancy, I know Mog talked about this as well, but it's critical. If you know, we have a situation today, the last numbers from last night reported a 97% occupancy rate in uh, Spartanburg County hospitals. Um, and if you went further to look at available beds, it was 17 as of midnight last night. So, you know, those are, those are critical numbers. And to be good citizens in our community, we have to be aware of those numbers when, when we have, uh, you know, a group as large as our student body. Um, that you know may impact that, or, or even our faculty and staff, and and what's the available ability in our own community then to be able to uh, use those resources. Um, then you know obviously campus case counts, and we saw that spike occur after we came back. We had all hoped that the pre-arrival testing might buy us a week or two. Um, the opposite happened in some ways, uh, but. Those numbers are important. And, and the final thing is our isolation and quarantine capacity. What's our ability to house the students who are, um, who are getting positive test results or have to quarantine? So all of those things are important. And it's kind of all those things get weighed together. And it's important that we see a downward trend or a trend of uh, you know, more availability, few, fewer cases, all of those things are very important when we make those decisions, uh, either to go remote or to return to in-person. Uh, I also track on a daily basis um, on a, my own personal graph uh, what the case counts are, how those are bouncing, and how they're comparing to what they were in the fall, and those are helpful to me. So thank you, Joanne. And the next question, I feel like we've already answered. Um, Will students, faculty, and staff have to submit a negative COVID test in order to return to in-person classes after the two-week remote period? If so, how will it be handled to prevent gaps in surveillance? Dan, I think you've answered that. Do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, let me go ahead and, I mean, there's, okay. there's another question at the very end okay. about, do we have the resources to test everyone on campus with our relationship with DHEC? Let me handle it together. Um, okay. I wrote the answer to this question two days ago, um, finalized it this morning, and information has changed by this afternoon. Uh, the, to make a long story short, I've been working for three days to try to arrange um, on-campus testing site uh, to be able to accomplish what everyone wants to accomplish in terms of having people tested before we returned in-person instruction. Um, I can say that we're very close. And I can say that I believe we're going to deliver that, but details will have to be forthcoming. And as someone else said, we'll have, you'll have to trust us on that one. Uh, regarding avoiding the gaps that we had last time, we learned a great deal. The lists that we started with have been cleaned up. Um, and we're, I'm also hopeful that uh, we're going to gain some information directly in this testing process that we didn't have available to us in the last one. So, um, so that's the answer to those questions. Okay, so skip to Mark. Here we go. Our wellness day is still a go. And what are we doing to ensure that those are safe? Beth Wallace, this one's for you. Um, as far as I know, I was asked um, Perry Henson the other day, we were talking about this and, and she felt, and I agree with her, that we should continue with the February 2nd, I'm looking at my days, which I know is right after we return, all of those events and everything that we are gathering as far as doing some things are all safe. They're all socially distanced outside or inside with limited capacity, um, pick up things. So our plan is to go forward with that unless we talk to Provost Sosolsky, and he thinks it's a good thing to delay that. Right now, it's February 2nd, February 24th, March 18th, and April 2nd. Knowing that those dates have really been pushed out there with faculty and staff are working towards some activities, and we welcome faculty's input on that as well, as well as the students, we're a little hesitant to pull back on that and not offer those opportunities. 
And as I was thinking about, it, I thought going remote and being in front of a screen, I think a wellness day might be in order, um, February 2nd. So our plans are to go forward and we welcome any suggestions or if you have any ideas that are safe and helpful for our students. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. And this is our last pre-submitted question. Will there be another round of CARES relief grants for students during the spring semester similar to the grants administered last semester? Chris. Um, I think the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, we did, you know, the Congress did pass and we uh, have received some guidance uh, related to another round of CARES uh, relief grants. The guidance is a little bit different this time around. And so uh, the last time around, the guidance was more limited in the ways that those funds could be delivered to students and what those funds needed to, uh, which needs for students those funds were available to address. It's a little bit more expansive and more permissive this time. Um, quite frankly, at this point, I, the, <laughs> there's a lot of ambiguity and uh, lack of clarity in the guidance that's been released. I imagine that's because it was passed right over the holidays and there maybe hasn't been quite as work, much work done on some of those issues as, uh, as would be helpful for all of us uh, who are receiving the funds. Uh, but I do think over the next uh, week to two weeks, we'll have better clarity on how and how best we can distribute those funds. Again, similar to the last time, we've got a little over half a million dollars that's specifically designated to support students. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, just trying to preserve the overall financial health of the institution, we've got about 1.1 million in this allocation that's available uh, to the college to defray our compliance costs related to COVID-19. Thank you, Chris. That's all of our questions. Thank you for participating and thank you to our panelists and all of the people behind the scenes who have made this event possible. Remember, you can find a recording and transcript of this event at wofford.edu slash coronavirus. This concludes our virtual town hall. Stay well, Terriers.